I am delighted to uh, have uh, Fernando Riemers, uh, Dean uh, Rob Hollister, and Dean Jay Halfin with us uh, to talk about today's question. And in this seminar, what we want to really look at is this notion of the global citizen. And what does global citizenship mean? And more importantly, what is the role of education in general and universities in particular in the creation of global citizenship? whatever it might mean. It is, it is a question of some importance, uh, certainly here at Boston University, but in all universities, the, at, at Tufts where Rob is coming from, at Harvard where uh, Fernando is coming from, and all, all, all sorts of universities are realizing that there's something happening out there. Uh, and there is something that we want to happen out there in terms of creating uh, and being part of this global moment. Uh, and trying to figure out how we take our structures and make them work best uh, toward that. So those are the questions that we want to talk about. Our three guests have, have agreed to start with fairly short opening uh, thoughts, and then we will get into a conversation first between them and then uh, with the audience. I had suggested to them at least two important questions that we hope we will get to. And one is this question of what does global citizenship mean? Uh, because, again, it's a big word, it's an important word, but it's not always a defined word. So having some thoughts on what we mean by global citizenship, and then the second issue of what can universities or what should universities be doing in creating uh, global citizenship. We will start with uh, Fernando. Fernando is a professor of education uh, at Harvard University. Uh, he is uh, he leads the international the global education program at uh, Harvard University and has worked in a whole host of developing countries with educationists at all levels of education, particularly on this idea of of global citizenship. We will then go to uh, Rob Hollister. Rob Hollister is a dear friend and a, and a, and a former colleague, uh, dean of of the Tisch College for Citizenship and Public Service at Tufts College, uh, at Tufts University, uh, and, and really sort of has, has been for many years the spirit behind infusing a, a very large number of very interesting programs on citizenship uh, and public service at Tufts, a, a university that already was had great pride in that. And then we will come to our own Dean J. Halfin, Dean of the, school, uh, the Metropolitan College here at Boston University, but also here because he is the chair of the Boston University President's Council on the Global University. So as I said, all three of them have thought very seriously about this subject. And therefore, let me uh, shut up and give the floor to our wonderful guest, starting with Fernando. All yours. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Let me first uh, thank and, and commend Professor Najam for uh, both uh, helping us all think about the future, I think we don't do that enough, and then uh, acting on the belief that uh, the most important challenges about the future are really don't fit ne neatly within the boundaries of a single discipline. They cross-disciplinary boundaries. And so I appreciate his leadership in bringing people from different disciplines to talk about that. Um, I'm going to say five things, and so I have about two minutes for each one of them. First one is that the notion that uh, education is fundamentally about developing citizenship and that at the core of citizenship is really equipping people with the skills and the dispositions to work out, to recognize their differences and work them in peaceful ways. That idea is as old as the idea of public education itself. And the first person on record to put forth that idea was a Moravian minister, John Amos Comenius, who lived through uh, in the 1600s through 30 years of civil war and, who conclu and religious persecution and who asked himself, why do people kill each other? over differences in values and so on. And he says, because we don't have the skills to work out our differences in better ways. And so he put forth this brilliant insight that if we just educated every person, then we would have a better option to violent resolution of conflicts. Of course, Comenius did not produce a technology that made it possible to educate everybody. It would take another 200 years for public education systems to be built. But throughout the creation of those systems, the aspiration that public education was fundamentally about very clear civic purposes, and that those civic purposes were not just about uh, sort of indoctrinating people in the social contract, but really allowing them the opportunities to uh, renegotiate the social contract that brought them together. Rousseau, uh, one of the very important figures of the Enlightenment, uh, produced that education was fundament a fundamental instrument of political socialization. And his view of the social contract, of course, was that that was a human construction. And when you had a contract that excluded enough people, eventually those people would revolt and work out their little revolution to renegotiate uh, the contract. Um, more recently, 
I think uh, before World War I and between the First and Second World War, there were a number of people that connected the aspiration of achieving peace with the necessity of aligning education systems with providing kids with the skills to make that peace possible. So there were people like Ava Myrdal in Sweden, for example, who was one of the early pioneers engaging with UNESCO, very, much, very active both in the, in the movement for women's civic and, politi uh, and political rights, in the peace movement, and in promoting education for all. Uh, in this country earlier, uh, Jane Addams, for example, had done that, Maria Montessori in Europe. Um, and there were a number of specific efforts to design curriculum to make it possible for people to have some of these global competencies. I'll define them in, in, in a moment. Uh, one of those groups was a group that created in Geneva the International Baccalaureate. These were a group of visionaries, of dreamers, in the 1960s that with funding from the Ford Foundation set out to try to answer the question of what would it take to equip people with the skills that would make it possible for them to move seamlessly across cultural boundaries and national boundaries and so on. And the IBE went on to become a large worldwide pedagogical movement. It's a very active movement in this country where public schools are increasingly embracing uh, the IB as a way to provide both rigor but also an, an excellence but also these global dispositions. So we come to the present. Oh, just one, one more stop in history. Uh, the first center for comparative education in the university, which was established at uh, Teachers College, was created uh, in part because the first three presidents of uh, Columbia University and of TC were convinced that <coughs> if we were to educate a um, large number of kids who were the first in their families to go to school and kids who came from different walks of life, it was very important for their teachers to look outside, to look abroad, and to really develop, um, we would call it today, intercultural competency, the ability to put the educational system, understand how it related to a social context, and, and understand it as a construction. So in 1928, one professor associated with that Center of Comparative Education, the very first in this country, Professor Isaac Kandel, in a, in a speech to the National Association of Secondary School Principals, makes the case for global education. He says one of the most important things we could teach in high school is to teach our kids how their lives are intertwined with the lives of other kids. Now, remember 1928. These, these are times when people understand the dangers of war. They see the unresolved tensions among, among countries, and they try to figure out, is there anything we need to teach every citizen so that we would make peace more likely? And, and Professor Kandel goes to great length in that speech in 1928 to uh, explain that these ha this is not being anti-American or communist, that global competency is something that deeply American and, and patriotic individuals can, can advocate as, as he is doing. The need today for global competency is as present as, as it was 100 years ago, as it was 400 years ago when Comenius put forth the notion. And I think part of what makes it now, uh, necessary is this process we've come to call globalization, uh, which is not new. We've had other waves of globalization, these uh, many processes that really tie our futures together with the lives of people from very different civilizational streams and in geographically remote locations. So what are some of these processes? Obviously one of them is trade, uh, another one is simply telecommunications, the very rapid development of telecommunications technologies that means that many of us can that, that our awareness, our consciousness, is not bound geographically in any way. Um, most of you, probably on a daily basis, are in communication with people in very different regions. So an earthquake takes place in Chile, and you are thinking about, about the impact of that earthquake in the people that you're communicating with in Chile. Or, uh, or uh, the floodings take place in Pakistan, and you know people who are directly affected by that, and that is in your consciousness, in your awareness. Um, so globalization brings us all into this big space, big space that is, is the result of an affirmative choice, of a design. We did try to create a global order, humanity, tried to create a global order after World War II. And the ambition was uh, of those visionaries who try to create that architecture, the UN, for example, was what would it take to create the conditions for lasting peace and security in the world? How do we make sure we never have these horrors that the world had just witnessed in World War II again? And then again, the aspiration was to build a global compact reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that would connect with people from different civilizational origins and then to create the institutional architecture to make it possible for every person to achieve those rights. Now, this is truly ambitious. In, I mean, imagine 1948, imagine the impact of, of that war on the lives and the consciousness of many people. 
And yet there are some who had the power to look at the future, to think about the future and ask, how do we make sure that this horror doesn't happen again? And they said, what we need is a contract that binds us all together. It's a contract that makes it impossible for me to achieve my humanity if I do not actively engage in helping every other human being in, in, in achieving their humanity. It's real visionary, real ambitious. The world has been fundamentally transformed because of that con compact. I'll speak about the area where I do my work, which is education. One of the articles in the Declaration is the article that um, affirms that education is a basic human right and that all children have the right to a fundamental education. Well, the institution that was created to achieve that right was UNESCO, and as a result of it, humanity was transformed. In 1948, most of the world's children did not have the opportunity to be, to be schooled. Uh, today, most of them begin school and spend in schools a number of years. The moral vision that, that, that was implicit in Article 26, I think, is the right to education, was that not only were we to educate all children, but we were to educate them in this global compact of human rights. That educating all children was about teaching them the importance of human rights as a covenant that brought humanity together. I think we kind of lost that moral clarity with time. And so many of the current efforts to ed educate all children, for example, those reflected in the Millennium Development Goals, the two objectives that are about education are really silent on the moral purposes of education. They're really about getting kids in schools and hoping that they will finish school without getting into the question of what should they be learning in school. So that brings me to the present. If we've known for such a long time that equipping all children with the skills that would help them work out differences across civilizational streams is important, why haven't we made more progress? And we haven't made more progress uh, in this country and in other countries. You just read the news. You see the board of textbooks in Texas is all aggravated because they believe that the textbooks are biased in, in favor of, of Islam. And we have this preacher a few weeks ago who was proposing to burn a bunch of, uh, of Korans in his church. And you, and you read that and you say, what are these people thinking? What do they, what do they know about globalization? What do they think this, the impact of this news is going to be in NWFP where I have been or in, or in Kandahar when this news instantaneously in less than 24 hours will be reported? And of course, the result is that we have the Secretary of, the phone, of, of Defense pick up the phone and call this guy and say, would you please hold it? Do you realize that you're putting lies of our, of our young people at risk by doing that. So, so we have more than a little problem in our midst, and the rest of the world has a little problem. So what, why is it that we're not doing a better, a better job and I, and in, in providing global education? And, and here uh, I'm going to speak based on my own involvement as, as chair of the advisory board to the Commission of Education for three years on global education, trying to promote global education in our schools. And, and as someone who spends a lot of time talking to principals and school leaders and teachers. It seems to me that we have four vacuums, four challenges. One is the challenge of leadership. I mean, this is an area where we need some people to simply lead and to begin to build the coalitions. Uh, the kinds of people that existed, the kinds of people like Isaac Kandel or Alva Myrdal or Maria Montessori, uh, who will make the case for global education. And of course, back to the question of what can the university do, uh, is lead itself and nurture that, that leadership. And of course, that means developing a narrative about what is global competency and, and how do we, how do we achieve it? This is some of what I've tried to do, and if you want to read some of my work, Google my name, you'll find a website that has some, uh, some attempts to contribute to answer that question. Second challenge is assessment. Um, the last 20 years have seen a worldwide revolution of education where we have imported some practices from business, where the idea is that what gets done is what gets measured, and that is a good principle. But it, it's easier to measure certain things than others, so we're all fascinated at the moment in this Commonwealth and in other places, measuring the ability of children to read and write and to do mathematics and perhaps to some extent science, not enough. And that's it. We don't really measure artistic competences. We don't measure creativity. We don't measure interpersonal skills. We don't measure a bunch of competencies that are fundamental to be a citizen, to be a contributing citizen, to get along with others, to live fulfilling lives, and to be happy. And so the consequence of that is that these very powerful instruments have distorted the purposes of our schools. Um, in talking to some of the leaders, and, and they have had that effect more in our most vulnerable schools, with the consequence that it is possible that global competency will be the next equity divide in our society. I do think that some of our schools, where the kids do well in the basic competencies, uh, do spend the time and the parents organize to provide enrichment opportunities for their kids to develop global competency in the after school, in extracurriculars, and so on. 
it's harder to get this done in the city of Boston because so many think that we're doing so poorly in helping our kids with the basics that who has time to teach geography, to teach world history, to teach about global institutions and so on. But of course, we may be doing those children a disservice because it may be precisely those skills that are going to give you access to the most productive jobs, the most creative jobs, the leadership positions in the society. Even in our military nowadays, if you speak certain foreign languages, you can enter with an earning premium of, I believe it is, uh, $20,000 per year, which is about a quarter million dollars of our lifetime career serving in the military. And so here we have the paradox in our country that we are in the fourth greatest wave of immigration in our society. We have just about every language on earth represented in our uh, heritage communities. And our schools continue to be as they were set out to be when Horace Mann got on his horse and convinced everybody we had to educate every, every kid a cemetery for foreign languages. Our schools are in the business of killing the linguistic skills that children bring other than English. And so so how does that help us as, as a country? I don't think it helps us very much, and it certainly doesn't help those particular kids uh, who, who lose that advantage. So second challenge is assessment. Search, third challenge is we need good curriculum and good pedagogy. I think we need part of the building a narrative for global competency is to help dispel the notion that you can achieve deep, deep global competency with globalization light. So we're all very happy about these annual uh, festivals where parents are invited to schools to bring their uh, foods from different ethnic origins and, and, and we all celebrate our diversity. Um, but Global competency is serious and hard work. It's about IB. It's like studying AP physics or AP history. Global competency is, a, is understanding the interdisciplinary dimensions of climate, for example, of conflict, of trade. And that requires serious work, hard study, teachers who spend the time, who are prepared, and materials who can support that engagement. And then, so we have a challenge of curriculum and pedagogy. And then in some communities, we have a challenge with parents who, of course, are a product of a different time and who may not themselves understand the connections between their circumstances because they don't have abundance of global competency. They may not value it in their kids. And um, so what can universities do? And I'll stop here. Well, I think universities can help define global competency and figure out how can we measure it. And to my mind, there are three components to global competency. One is intercultural competency, and the ability to really leave the old aspiration that Montaigne had engraved in a beam in his library. Nothing human is foreign to me. And so if we can create the conditions so that kids and young people and people in general do not feel threatened, do not feel uh, uh, challenged when they encounter cultural diversity and when they feel comfortable and they see that difference as a source of opportunity for constructive exchanges, that, is, that requires hard and serious work. It doesn't get done with these festivals uh, once a year in the schools. Second dimension is deep knowledge and understanding of foreign languages. I think that learning foreign languages is to global competency as stereoscopic vision, is to, is to the ability to see. Uh, you understand the world very differently mm -hmm. once you can communicate and understand the nuance and the insights that are written in another language, not in a translation. It doesn't really matter which language, another language. And the third dimension, of course, is deep knowledge of topics such as world history, geography, which is not taught in our schools anymore, uh, and topics, the process of globalization itself. We need to develop materials to teach globalization. Back to the question of the divide, who's doing this? The most advantaged schools. I'm now working with a private group that is developing a series of global schools that are going to be placed in the major cities to make it possible for the children of people who move about to have a seamless experience, kind of an IB. And they want to put at the core of those schools a global curriculum. But I don't see many of our inner city schools engage in those efforts of teaching that. So what can universities do? What they were set out to do when Humboldt, not the explorer, but his brother, chartered Berlin. And this was the last reinvention of the university. These were talking 250 years ago. And Humboldt said universities are about three things. They are one, about promoting the ability to advance knowledge through the independent and unrestrained pursuit of the truth research. Two, promote critical thinking, the ability of people to think for themselves. Three, to enlighten the public. Universities are about holding states, of course Humboldt was thinking about the Prussian state, accountable by educating primarily those who are not members of the university community. The U.S. took those aspirations of, of Humboldt, especially in the land-grant universities, and perfected them with a vengeance, and we built the best higher education system in the world. But I think for most of our universities, we dropped the ball on extension. We took research and teaching very, very seriously. And I, think we, I still think we do a very good job in those on a worldwide scale. But extension is not really taken seriously. So when I talk to university presidents about the fact that if it isn't universities that engage in 
becoming the partners of K through 12 schools in our country in promoting global competency. No one else is better positioned to do it. They say, well, that sounds good. You can do what you want in your own time. But they don't say this is a very important institutional mission and we should put serious resources and priority behind that. So let me stop here. I've been trying to be provocative. I'm sorry if I went a little bit you, above you my have, time. Thank you very much. You have been provocative and I think you've been, you've been thought expanding also. I think thank you for setting us up uh, in, in this big and bold fashion. I, I was particularly, particularly intrigued and pleased with your reference to UNESCO. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I'm going to get this right, but my example of probably the single best sentence ever written by committee is one of the sentence in one of UNESCO's founding documents, which, which I think is something like, war begins in the minds of men, and in the minds of men, war must end. Uh, right. and, and that's the moral sort of clarity of the purpose of education. Uh, that that institution was at least set up for. Uh, so, so, so thank you for all of that. Rob. Dale, thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's, uh, I came for two reasons. One is uh, the topics at the heart of my work, uh, and also I miss you. Uh, we, uh, uh, it, was a, it, was, it, was a, it was a big loss for Tufts University. Uh, when BU made you an irresistible uh, offer. Uh, but uh, it's great to see what exciting work the Party Center is doing under, under your leadership. Oh, you know, with the two questions that you've posed to us, I, I liked very much uh, what you said, Fernando. And the one, the one additional piece to the answer of what's global citizenship that I would want to add is... Um, uh, an impulse, a commitment to action, uh, to to raise up the number of the, the portion proportion of people with exactly those competencies that you outlined so eloquently, um, who are committed to healing the world, to making a difference on the main, major challenges um, that we that we face. But I thought what I would do is to uh, offer a few comments on the second question of. Uh, the role uh, of universities. Because I think what's happening around the world, and to me, the most exciting thing that's happening in the, in the higher education sector is a, a global trend, a global movement to break out of the ivory tower uh, and to embrace uh, and enact the concept of the engaged university. Uh, and that there, there's still plenty of examples around the world of universities that are following the, the ivory tower model. But it's striking uh, to, to observe uh, and to seek to learn from the growing number of colleges and universities on all continents uh, who are uh, becoming uh, engaged universities, who are re-embracing and elevating their civic engagement and social responsibility movement. And so in terms of the, the kinds of actions that universities are taking increasingly and can continue to in the future, um, one is curricular, educating uh, future global citizens, educating uh, leaders for change. Uh, and a second kind of um, uh, activity uh, by the higher ed sector uh, is what you said, Fernando, about the extension d dimension. The, the explicit and conscious application of university resources, the expertise and the person power uh, of universities to attack pressing uh, societal challenges through applied research, through volunteer service, through training uh, efforts uh, with non-matriculated populations. And a third key meaning and opportunity is in the area of institutional policies uh, and practices. Uh, to have, to see a growing number of universities uh, around the world seeking to be good global citizens, quote unquote, uh, and to apply standards to themselves that are parallel to and consistent with the learning outcomes uh, that you uh, advocated on things like design of buildings, energy consumption practices, 
uh, employment practice particular practices, particularly with respect to lowest paid workers, uh, investment policies with uh, the funds that they that they manage. We uh, just uh, one to then shift from that uh, kind of optimistic view and advocacy of the kinds of work that universities are increasingly doing uh, internationally. Uh, let me talk, uh, finish these opening uh, remarks uh, by telling you a little bit about a group that uh, the president of my university, Larry Bacow, and I and a colleague from DC named Susan Stroud, who runs the um, Center for uh, Innovations and in Civic Participation. Five years ago, uh, we were intrigued and we thought it was very, it was significant to see uh, the venturesome steps that schools around the world were taking around raising up their civic mission. And so we organized the first uh, fully international opportunity for the heads of those institutions to talk about it. So we brought together 29 uh, presidents, vice chancellors, rectors of universities from 23 countries to talk about what do you, what are you currently, what's your current civic mission, what do you want to do in the future? And we worried, we, we knew that there was exciting stuff happening, but we weren't confident that that would, could be a real discussion because we were acutely aware of how dramatically different their uh, university systems uh, are and the contexts in which they operate are so divergent. But it was the most um, exciting three days of my life to listen to those heads of institutions talk about how they were changing their civic and social responsibility work. The level of common vision was extraordinary. If you were to look at, listen to the president of Al-Quds University and Haifa University uh, and Afad uh, College for Women in the Sudan and Anjan University in, in Vietnam. The level of common purpose and strategy and program was just uh, palpable. Uh, following that meeting, they said, let's, let's keep in touch. Let's keep, let's keep going. Let's find ways to support each other's work going forward. Uh, my college has played a, a secretariat role for that loose network, and it now has grown in the last five years to 180 uh, colleges and universities uh, in 59 countries, uh, operating through a process of uh, functions of exchange, uh, joint training activities, an annual prize, and seeking to grow and accelerate this international movement. And I think what's exciting about this uh, movement is that it's simultaneously achieving three impacts. One is some real uh, results with respect to local and international conditions as they mobilize their resources to tackle tough problems. But then in addition to that, the most exciting examples are where that direct action by the university results in uh, educational outcomes, educating future leaders for change, educating uh, global citizens. And then the third very important consequence, and particularly important in the developing world where uh, higher education is so underfinanced, uh, uh, is that increasingly visible results of the first two that I mentioned are beginning to uh, have a positive impact on public support um, for higher education. So let me just uh, stop there uh, and would invite, I'd uh, love to hear uh, others' experience uh, around those 
those broad topics and themes. Rob, you explained the initiative. You want to also name it? It's the. It's called the Talwar Network. Yes. Of a global coalition of engaged university uh, and universities. Every moment is a marketing moment. Can, can I uh, <laughs> put, pa pass out our brochures? I'm gonna and if, if some of this resonates with any of you, we'd love to. Uh, uh, to trade experience and explore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, especially uh, I, I, I found of the many things interesting there, sort of you're, you're naming the personality of the university institution as a global citizen it itself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we usually think of our students uh, being the global citizens we are training. But the university as a person, university as an institution, yeah. Is, is also an institutional citizen uh, and, and a very global one just by virtue of who, who teaches there and who, who, who studies there. Uh, with that, uh, Jay. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I, I'm a dean, I can't help myself. I'm gonna be very practical, pragmatic, and I hope not too skeptical or cynical. But when I think about our performance as universities, and, and you're, you're represented by, by three leading universities here, when I think about a report card for how we do on developing global citizens, I, I feel we're probably very strong at sending our students, especially our young students, abroad for what we call study abroad experiences. We're even better at welcoming um, foreign students, foreign scholars, uh, faculty from other countries. We're wonderful at those things. What I find interesting and maybe ironic is that I'm not sure we're nearly as good developing and cultivating meaningful global awareness within our home campuses. And as uh, Adel mentioned, we've been working for the last few years in the President's Council on a number of initiatives. And we're always looking at, at entrepreneurial things we could be doing abroad and, and ways in which we can create new programs. Um, we're just now returning to this question of, of what should we be doing inculcating stimulating within our, 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 especially our undergraduate curriculum. And, and it's, it's fascinating how a school like Boston University has such vast, rich, um, international, global resources, assets um, among our faculty and students, and how, frankly, poor we are at integrating and applying those assets in a meaningful way towards actually furthering education. Um, that may be my cynical message, and I, and I, but I'm going to try to come up with a few I hope positive recommendations as well. Uh, but, but why is that the case? Um, well, I think part of it is that simply having people from other countries on campus doesn't make a for global citizenship. That, 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 that in itself is not sufficient for a number of reasons. Uh, exposure is not enough. Um, there are challenges to communication, um, ways in which students simply do not interact with, with, uh, with each other, with, with faculty, uh, how and, and, and faculty may not be interacting among each other as well. And so that's not sufficient. And secondly, uh, and I'll quote Derek Bach, uh, former president of Harvard on this, that only a small minority of students appear to take any coursework at all that would prepare them as citizens to understand America's role in the world and the global problems that confront it. Um, there, of course, are relevant courses, but they're often concentrated in a few disciplines. Of course, we offer many, many languages, but um, and I'm going to echo Fernando's point, there's really linguistic atrophy that takes place, not linguistic development. Uh, only 8% of America's undergraduates say that their language, foreign language ability actually improves as a result of college. Um, only about 12% of American undergraduates participate in study abroad. Um, and those that do are often going to places in which they frankly mix with other Americans to a large extent. And very rarely, I think only about 10% of those who, uh, of that 12% actually reside in a foreign university when they're abroad. And so it's, um, we don't, and, and even then, are they really getting to know the world? They may get to know perhaps one place better than they uh, might have otherwise. So um, I, I think we, we, we talk in ideals, but there's often a gap between the ideals and the reality, I think. Um, Okay, uh, what are some of the practical things that I believe we should do? Um, and I'm going to echo Fernando again on this. Uh, avoid tokenism, um, the festivals, et cetera. Uh, or simply creating a, sing a single curricular hurdle um, and that, that, that we put in, you know, 
in, in the way of students' graduation and then declare victory that we now have uh, global students. Um, we should be generating a limitless menu of possibilities, of opportunities for students and, and, and not simply try to compartmentalize this in any particular way. Um, we should take advantage of immersion opportunities wherever they may occur. Uh, even in our own backyard, um, we're, we're blessed with so many interesting immigrant communities within the greater Boston area. That's almost a, a local study abroad experience that, 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 that perhaps can exist. Um, there are teachable moments that occur all the time, um, and, and my colleagues refer to some of those things. When those occur, um, we should treat those as unfolding case studies that are going on in the world. Find some way of creating um, uh, 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 service opportunities, um, participant observation opportunities, consulting opportunities, ways in which we, we, we can sort of, in a, from, in a curricular sense, drop everything and, and, and realize that there's something more interesting going on around us that we could take advantage of. And I, I think it's a faculty responsibility. Um, a third idea is to exploit our technology a lot better than we do. Um, one of the challenges of creating international experiences is simply getting people together. And t technology mitigates that. And we don't necessarily have to physically co-locate in order to have a, um, a, a community experience that, that's, that's beyond our, our boundaries. Um, we, we should be using online distance learning, we should be using communication technology, ways in which we can bring people together without bringing people together. And, and I think there's so many um, unfulfilled um, opportunities there that we um, simply have to pay more attention to. Um, also, um, my fourth point is, um, and I want to paraphrase uh, George Bernard Shaw here, I think, I think global development, awareness, consciousness, just like youth, is wasted on the young. Um, we shouldn't think that we have to front load this in the lives of people either in the K through 12 years or in their four undergraduate years. It doesn't have to happen and, and certainly doesn't stop happening when one is 22 years old. And, and so we, we, we need to, I think, be thinking much more broadly about what we mean by our extension responsibilities um, beyond simply what do we superimpose on an already jam-packed undergraduate curriculum at most institutions. And there are many, many things that we, we do and can do. Um, I think some of those would be, um, um, just like we've created study abroad at the undergraduate level, we should have study abroad at the graduate level. And I think executive MBA programs have been very good at leading in that. Um, there, there should be destination courses built into graduate programs um, more and more. I, th I think, I think at, there are ways in which we can, we can build that experience and, and not simply expect it to happen during you know, the junior year of an undergraduate program when you're 21 years old. Um, secondly, I think um, we should think about study abroad not just as a one-way, almost imperialistic sense of us going abroad, uh, whoever that us is, but think of this as a two-way movement and have reverse study abroad in reverse and, and be much more welcoming um, of students coming here for one semester stints, just like we send American students abroad for one semester stints. Um, that is a chance to co-mingle students from other countries in ways that we really have not developed. Um, we've, we've almost expected students from other countries to commit at very expensive American um, prices to, to have to come for a complete degree program. Well, that, that's simply prohibitive for, for even, even saying the majority of the world's population is an understatement. And so we really need to find ways of bringing others to American universities to mix with, our, with, with students on our campuses that, that do not require that, that, that level of commitment. Um, also, um, I think um, one of the unfulfilled promises of distance learning, getting back to that a little bit, is distance learning, to, if done well, is focusing on the needs of, of mature, part-time, working professional students. Well, 
um, that has the potential of creating a virtual community, not just nationally, but internationally as well. Uh, for people who never would come to the United States for an academic experience, for a number of reasons, both professional and family, but would find it very fascinating to engage um, um, maybe you know, at, the, at the graduate level, uh, um, in, 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 some, somewhat akin to, to what Rob was saying uh, among presidents and senior administrators, to actually be able to work with one another academically without having to, to move to do so. Um, so I guess in conclusion, um, I think it's, it's counterproductive in some ways to try to force feed a meaningful experience, and, and especially in, in that singular sense, uh, only on the undergraduate level. Um, there's only so much that one can expect in, in, in those four years. But I think if we're successful, we'll provide a, an important foundation, um, we'll stim stimulate some degree of awareness, certainly curiosity, certainly that willingness and interest and obsession with becoming a global lifelong learner and therefore be able to take advantage of future experiences beyond simply those that are offered when one's in college. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's three, three, three very wonderful, very, very polite, but I think all in different ways, all three of you have thought, put forth thought-provoking and provocative ideas, maybe some even controversial ideas. Before I throw it open to the audience, if I can, if I can see if any of you have any comments on each other, and by way of further provocation, let me throw one, one question. We've heard a little, but not as much as one might have expected about the changing geography of glo global education. Uh, both in terms of U.S. universities thinking there's a global marketplace of students and we need to go to the students rather than them coming, foreign campuses and so on and so forth, as well as other countries and other universities elsewhere uh, sort of wanting to take a bigger part of the global marketplace of students and whether that changes the notion of what we have to offer and what students are looking to, 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 to gain from universities. But, but just one thought. Apart from that, anything that any of you would want to say to any of your colleagues, please. I'd like to make two comments on two things that I found uh, fascinating. One is, of course, the network you have built, it's so simple and it's brilliant in its simplicity, right? Why don't you just convene people who are trying to get the university to do service, to talk about what they're doing and to exchange experiences? And so, I mean, this is the age of networks, but I know that how hard it is to try to do that because each of these leaders who comes in, if you're going to get to reorient the university to take more seriously sort of the extension mission, has to build a, a constituency within their own, their own university. So I'd love to hear you say a bit more about the challenges of, of, of convening those groups. And I assume that your group is not just about bringing them together to a conference, but you're actually, there is a, an activist a role. You're trying to get them to become better at, at this thing, and maybe there are other things beyond the convening. I, I'm, I'm, I admire what, what you have done and appreciate that it, it, it was not easy. I heard you talk about extension and the opportunities of using technology to build virtual communities. That's another one that is so obvious. But so many, but so many places. Yeah, it, it is obvious. But why, why isn't it been done by all universities? Why is it that we're still teaching? I mean, if you think about the basic model that we have, it's still we take people at a very young age in their lives, uh, we concentrate them in a geographic area, we spend a lot of time and attention on them, send them into the world, and wish them well, and maybe once a year ask them for a check. And what you're saying is, why don't we turn that paradigm on its head? Why don't we connect with people who are already doing interesting things, not at one particular point in life? throughout their lives and not in one particular location, use technology essentially to create a different model of university. But I don't find that model implemented in most places, which tells me it's probably very challenging to do. I, I can certainly speak from experience that I become very interested in using technology precisely as a way to reach other communities. And two years ago, I realized I couldn't through my own school. I work in a university that is very compartmentalized, essentially little fiefdoms uh, within each place. I could not persuade people that we could do distance education to run our programs. So I had to go to the extension school, which is really leading us. And I will confess that I engaged my online teaching at the beginning with a lot of prejudice, with a lot of misconceptions. I thought this would be kind of my service to the world. I did not think I was going to find the wonderful students that I found in them. In many ways, much more interesting than the students who come. I direct a program in the school that brings together 65 people who are interested in leadership in global education. And, and so now the challenge I have 
is how do I connect the two? And where I am, I've concluded I can't. It's, uh, there's just no way that I can connect those students that I teach. So I basically repeat my classes. I teach on Friday morning a group of students who are physically here in my program. And then the extension school tapes my class. I have online, in Friday afternoon, I'm online uh, where I have 50 students in different places. So what are some of the obstacles and, and how do you overcome them to make that more, more mainstream, to use extension and to teach these lifelong learners throughout the world, make that more of the core business of the university? And so maybe you could each speak about the challenges you face and how you've overcome them. Uh, you know, the, oh gosh, it, talking about challenges and obstacles in an academic culture. <laughs> you know where to begin, you know, we gotta draw our paychecks. Right by tomorrow, we'll, we'll still be here, yeah. Uh, you know, you're right about the, you know, the frictions of, um, you know, distance and, and all of this takes t staff time. Um, uh, and, and money, but I, I think I think we're we're wrestling with a topic where there's a lot of change going on. And if I could, in part, refuse to answer the question and and talk m more about positive opportunity, I think it's precisely at those moments of ferment and experimentation at change and change where. Uh, modest, pretty basic efforts to make more visible what's already going on and mm. to foster respectful exchange of experience, south-north as well as north-south and south-south is just en enormously productive in terms of encouraging and reinforcing people who want to change the curricula and the research and the other aspects of their own institutions. Um, and just provide, you know, sharing information about what what works mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, and, and what mm -hmm, doesn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what would you add, well, Jay? Um, and I don't want to take us off on a tangent talking about the, uh, the mechanics of um, distance learning, but I think it could it takes. I think it takes two things. I think it takes courage and resources, and 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 they're, and they're both precious commodities in, in in a university. But what it avails us to be able to do, I think, which is very important, is. I think if, if you set up the proper and effective infrastructure to let this happen, it, it creates a much higher probability of deep communication than one can, I believe, ever have in a classroom alone among people who only get a few seconds of airtime in, in any one class. And, and, and so the potential for depth which I think is, I think depth correlates, I believe, with, with, with developing a, a, a cultural and global appreciation. So, so once you have this infrastructure and once you can attract mature, thoughtful students who have this kind of intercultural bias, in a sense, in a positive way, I think, I think it's, it's, um, it's limitless. And, 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 it, and, and, it, and it also, in a practical sense, can support individuals who will never have, who, who, are, who, are, who are too busy in their own lives to ever be able to do anything but this, this mode of education. Because they're doing good things. They're doing right. good things. Right. And, and they have families, and they have jobs, right. and they have careers, and they're not going to give those up right. for, the, for, the, for the opportunity of being in a Tufts or BU or Harvard classroom, necessarily. Right. Right. And, and, and so, now, as to why it hasn't happened yet, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's always good to open the questions on the note of I don't know. Mm. Uh, <laughs> that's where, where, where the essence of questioning begins. We have wonderful people in the room. Please wait for the mic. The mic is needed just so that your voice is recorded for the, uh, for, for, for the, for the camera. We'll take a few questions and then come back to the panel here and then Joe. Uh, yes, thank you to all of you. Uh, Henny Moefe from the School of Medicine. I, I, my, in reflecting on what, uh, what has just been said, it seemed to me that you know, systems work the way they're designed to work. And you know, part of the reason, even though we had these intellectuals in the 20s and the 30s who thought about global education, part of the reason it didn't happen is because the US was on top in many ways and having a sense of global citizenship uh, was stereotyped as maybe having transnational socialist leanings and uh, et cetera. And as the world is changing, we're changing in our rhetoric, but not so much in our actions. And when, I, when we talk about what the role of the university is, you know, as a faculty member, I would like to see more uh, resources put forward for real exchange. Uh, and what I mean by that is 
when we say we're going to have a twinning relationship with another university, that's not to simply send our expertise to XYZ country, mm -hmm. but to actually expect that their faculty are going to come not just in the languages, not just in the cultural uh, uh, topics, but are actually going to come and teach us. You know, I would like to see an infectious disease expert from a country that actually takes care of patients with infectious disease come and teach medical students. I would like to hear somebody from uh, the business school in India talking about their new models of making you know, the cost go from 100 to 1 mm. uh, to teach our students, not just for a semester, but on an ongoing relationship. Uh, whether that means having you know, open Skype uh, between classes and universities such that people are, can ask questions real time and actually hear the responses from somebody who doesn't have their same background. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the best way for that is, but I know that a lot of what has been done thus far is, you know, as Fernando said, that that sounds really amazing to do on your own time, right. but it's not part of our core mission. And I feel like the university needs to make it more part of the core mission. If you can pass it to Joe. Uh, Joe, please uh, introduce yourself for those of you. Who, who Joe Fusmith, uh, Department of International Relations at BU. Um, I'm actually curious about what you think is the legitimate role of the university in public advocacy. Uh, all of you have stressed uh, that this is not just a university problem. It's a lifelong problem, including K-12. to uh, I still have a child in high school, so I'm pretty well aware of the failure of the schools at that level. Um, and, and uh, you know, in this particular commonwealth, we, of course, have the MCAS system, which is designed not for global education, but to support a sense of American and Western history and philosophy. And it strikes me as uh, something that prevents, absolutely prevents, our high school and elementary school teachers from having an appreciation and time to introduce other cultures, uh, whether it's Asia, South Asia, um, Middle East, et cetera. Uh, and of course, uh, again, Fernando's uh, wonderful comment about universities as graveyards of languages, uh, we're building that on a very good foundation. The, the, uh, the elementary schools, we introduce foreign languages typically at seventh grade when the mouth can no longer produ produce those sounds and when the hormones have no desire to. Um, this is probably the worst possible time to introduce a foreign language. So the commitment of the schools is to tell people we want you to learn foreign languages as poorly as you can. And the universities, as you say, finish the job off. Um, so I think that we need to have some real public advocacy. And maybe it happens and I'm just not aware of it. But I'd, I'd sort of like to say what is the role of Harvard, Tufts, and BU in telling our state legislatures um, this isn't the way to go. I, I have a bunch of questions here and at the back. Let me take two more and then come back. I, I, have, I have people noted. Uh, let me take one from Ahmed there at the back. Joe, by the way, is also the director of the Center for Study of Asia here and a member of the global, uh, the, the President's Council on the Global University. Ahmed. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, my question is in the same fashion with Professor Fivsim. It's uh, Although it's going to probably sound a bit less professional and more provocative. One is, isn't... We are seeking the role of universities, but isn't that too late, high school and before education? It seems like most of students, undergraduates who come here are also expecting to open their minds to a new life, having realized that their education so far is not enough. And as graduate students, teachers, we here are seeking that. The second one is, if you take the definition of global citizenship, apart from someone who travels a lot internationally and can speak different languages, because I've seen such people who still have the same bigot minds and limited understanding of other cultures. I think a bit of the problem is to open the question of, you know, West-centric or Eurocentric understandings of other cultures and teaching of history and political science, international relations and other disciplines through not only multidisciplinary but also a multicultural and multi-civilizational um, uh, uh, perspective and in that setting even uh, sort of university education here and the textbooks that are used in the universities are 
have a lot of shortcomings and is administrates itself. We like have a lot on the table. I have one, two, three, but I'll come to you in the second round if that's okay, so that we give them enough time to not forget the questions. Let me just add to the last question this this notion of global citizenship. Uh, to me, also evokes a notion that the citizen takes the globe, the world, as as, as what they are part of, and and that seems to be more different, much much bigger than just saying I. I, I will I will collaborate with a colleague in China, uh, and is that really the challenge, or is it simply equipping our students ourselves with the the the, the economics of globalization as we see it? I haven't said it well, but, but but that sort of a thought. Any of you, and then we'll take a second round of questions. Any and all of you. I, I wanted just to pick up, uh, Henning, on on your question um, about exchanges and partnerships. Uh, I think one of the troubling uh, aspects of our of our landscape is that we've proliferated partnership, international uh, higher ed partnerships that aren't serious. Um, they're, they're very limited. They're under-resourced. There are far too many of them to do them well. And I think there's an opportunity for all of our institutions to pick out to commit ourselves to deep, long-term, mutually designed and run, well-resourced collaborations that have exactly those features that you mentioned. And if we're able to do just one of those or a, a, a handful of those in um, a larger number of uh, North American universities, uh, the impact could be uh, very substantial. It would open us up to new insights and new forms of accountability that break beyond some of the strictures that we're uh, operating under. Uh, and I think it's possible. I mean, there are all kinds of political difficulties to making those choices, but we're really wasting resources and we're wasting opportunities now. We, we, you know, we're stuck in a kind of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, and, and, and we're just not really ha achieving the research, the educational, the service outcomes uh, that, that we could. But I think the good news is that some fraction of those myriad collaborations that are out there are very good and they are well led and, and are ex have exactly the ingredients that make them a good investment. Fernando? On, on your last qu uh, question um, on, on what is global citizenship, I think that it's not just about the kind of competency that allows you to uh, draw economic benefits from, from globalization or lead. I think it's really about developing a, a cosmopolitan perspective that allows a person to understand that we have responsibility for global affairs and to sustain that. So if I could answer with an anecdote, to me a model of citizen was Benjamin Franklin also a global citizen, but that's another story. So Ben Franklin uh, created a narrative of what this American experiment of democracy was going to be, which was basically democracy is what ordinary human beings do when they engage with others to build a public space. So this guy shows up in Philadelphia where conversations are pretty boring because people don't read, and what does he do? He talks to five of his friends who all read a lot, and they say, why don't we each donate a piece of our library and create a public library and hire somebody to charge a fee? And he built a ton of institutions with that attitude. Well, global citizenship is extending that mindset and that action, that engagement, to maintaining a global order that allows us to live in peace. And so what does that mean? It means that if there is a tragedy in Haiti that is causing human suffering in that region. That is my business. This is not somebody else's business. It is my business. And I have the same responsibility Ben Franklin had to build a library to make conversations richer, to try to figure out how do I work with colleagues in Haiti and in other places to reduce that suffering. So it's not just about doing business in an economic sense. It's about developing a cosmopolitan perspective that is not contemplative, that is very much of a perspective that gets you in the world and to make the world. Now, I do believe on the question of which values and so on, that in order to have a global order, you need some rules, you need some institutions. I think we're better off with the UN than without it. I think we're better off having mechanisms to arbitrate disputes for trade and, and for war than without them. I think we're better off having UN forces than without them. And I think we need those mechanisms, the International Court of Justice and so on. In order to have them, it is imperative that the citizens of that global order understand what they exist and they support them. 
It's imperative that we pay our taxes, our dues, so that we can benefit from a world which allows us to trade, to resolve international disputes, to intervene when there are crimes committed against humanity, and so on. And so on. The question of which values is a complicated, it's a very complicated one, and it's one that I've thought a lot about, and my own point of view is not politically correct, but I want to put it out there. I think that to, to exercise global citizenship, we need a common framework of values that engages the enterprise. It doesn't mean American values. It doesn't mean Pakistani values. It means values that resonate with different traditions of different civilizational streams, values that have to be with respect and reciprocity, concern for life, concern for others. Now, the people who draft the Declaration of Human Rights struggle mightily with trying to draw a compact that connected with different civilizational traditions. But I, I don't think it's possible to engage global citizenship from a cultural relativistic point of view that says, well, President so-and-so just stole an election, and he's decided that he's going to fire the Supreme Court and the members of Congress, and maybe that's the way they do it, in that place. No, that's wrong. Or President so-and-so decided that those who speak against them, he's going to jail and torture. That is not acceptable. So we should have a, a I, I think of the Declaration of Human Rights as a work in progress. It gives you a foundation. There are so many things that are undefined, that are in the details. But we need to work towards achieving a compact that is even much more operational to help us figure out, so what do you do when somebody's put in jail because of their political beliefs? You know, is, do, you, do you have a sense of what's right and what's wrong in that case? Anyway. Jay, particularly on, you know, you, you had said don't front load it, and part of, I think, the pushback is maybe we need to front load it much before. Okay. Uh, a couple of comments, and, I, and I, I'm going to agree and maybe slightly disagree with my two colleagues. Um, on, the, on the question of partnerships, I, I echo Rob's points entirely. Um, the, the superficial, symbolic ones that are on paper but not in reality, there's, there are simply too many of those. They're distracting, they're noisy, et cetera. However, and, and, this, and this is more, more to that point, there are ways in which you can find those few, um, those precious few that are worth the commitment, worth the investment, and you need to hardwire those in some way. You, you, you need to make sure that they're, they're, they're not simply um, whimsical because a few champions, uh, uh, institutional champions, happen to believe and agree on that particular notion. Um, joint degrees become a way of doing that. You, 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 want, you want these kinds of programs to have, have longevity simply beyond the founding fathers of, of, those, of those programs. On the question about values, and um, I, um, I, I, I just found, I found it fascinating to kind of measure my own reaction to it in a sense. Um, I think when it comes to um, the value of scholarship, the value of research and evidence that we produce in the university, um, we, 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 we certainly, I think, are in very strong grounding when it, when it, when it comes to how that can impact um, uh, the world around us. When it comes to standing for something as an institution, when it comes to our responsibility as an institution externally, that begins to suggest that we are going to pick and choose which things we do stand for. And um, that begins, to, and, I, and I, I completely buy the point about how we can't be completely relativistic. We can't simply um, not stand for anything. The question is, can you stand for something that, that is, is also tolerant of the exceptions and the variations to that as well, and that, and that looks for that clash of opinion about what those values may be? It seems like it needs to be a dynamic, ongoing discussion and, and not simply cast in stone as part of an institution. And, and so I found myself recoiling a bit at the notion that, um, that, we, that, that we ought to, to overly potentially overly define what an institution stands for, for fear that, that may be a constraining factor as well as a liberating factor. But I completely accept the point that you've got to make some decisions, you've got to make some commitments, and there needs to be some buy-in among the citizens of that, of that institution. And, and so having those rallying cries are important. Um, and, but, but I, I, and, I, and I think the examples that Fernando pointed out are superb ones in which they provided a framework without necessarily constraining how that framework is used, uh, whether it was Ben Franklin in Philadelphia creating libraries, hospitals, universities, et cetera, or, um, or, the, the, or, or, the, or the emerging United Nations to, uh, helping to define what individual rights might be. Um, 
th that broad framework is so important, but at the same time, a university has, has to be, I believe, um, a pluralistic uh, institution. Fernando, very briefly, and then we have the questions piling up. I just want to go back to your question, what can the university do? And I think it was a question of the role of advocacy. There is a very simple thing universities can do and have done in the past that have influenced what happens in K through 12. Change the way we admit students. So I, I design a program that I run, an international education policy program, and I said I'm interested in producing people who can lead, who can lead ethically in education. And so that means when I admit them, I tell them, you tell me you want to lead ethically, show me what you've done. And when I have students who tell me I have perfect scores, I've never done anything but take care of my studies, I say, why don't you go and do something for the world and come back in two years? And it has a tremendous impact. I've run this program now for 11 years. I have 600 graduates. And you get institutions to contact you and say, we would like some of our students to get the jobs your graduate get. What is it that we need to do to help them develop the competence? And I say, help them do something for the world. It doesn't have to be on a large scale. It can be very small. So I... You know, I have a program whose identity, whose narrative is about social justice and contributing to advance that. And I admit students who have shown some commitment to that. And you don't show that commitment to that when you spend all your time in your library, even if you have perfect SAT scores. We'll take a second round, starting with the gentleman here, and then we have four questions right up front. I am H.P. Kanodia from India. I am an industrialist and uh, editor-in-chief of business economics and running a center, education centers in India. I am very much uh, impressed and amazed of the talks. First, it's about the events. We must have the world events for achieving our aim. And second, it, every individual, each individual has to make an effort to this end. This year, in the first week of January, I had organized a conference World Confluence of Humanity, Power, and Spirituality. I found that more war had happened on ground of religions. And so we must develop the humanity. And ATS speakers from all over the world had come. About 20,000 audience were there, and 15 to 20,000 students were from all over the university were there. So this is good gestures and what the professor is doing, it is very good. And I invite people who want to come. The second conference will be from 2nd January 2011 to 4th January. And I will bear the expenses for economic class. Anybody wants to come, it will be Thank you. my guest. Thank you. I'm sure people will look it up. Uh, let's, let's go to Professor Snath and then, then there. Yeah. Well, my name is Hasnath, and I'm a private citizen, certainly not an intellectual, and hardly educated. <laughs> That's <laughs> not true. Let me be very brief, because time is short. In the middle of 1990s, there was a very sensational article was published by Professor Martha Nussbaum. He is now, she is now in, in Chicago, but at that time she was in Brown. And the name of the article is Cosmopolitanism versus Nationalism. Right. And I do not know any other article except Sam Huntington's Class of Civilization and Fukuyama's End of History, which received in the next week 13 to 17 rebuttal. And if my memory is correct, out of 17, only two or three in favor, and nearly 14 or 15 against. And then the case died down. The main theme of our argument that the children of United States should be educated in a way that they will feel more as a citizen of the world rather than the citizen of the United States. I can give a lot of examples, but let me finish, conclude what is my question. That we, the intellectuals, think more in terms of global. Let us take the trade. Day before yesterday, in the Wall Street Journal front page, there was a P Foundation research report that nearly 87% of Americans believe that America should follow a protected trade, where only 13% believe that there should be a free, free trade. Mm. And all we know that free trade is better theoretically uh, in the minds of intellectuals is better than protection. So how university is going to mitigate this contradiction, what we think in the university and what people think on the street? Yeah. Thank you. There may be less, we have a question there, there may be less appetite for global than, than we think. 
Um, all three of you have dealt with uh, the university um, as though the university is an island unto itself with society. I'm very intrigued. None of you talked about the government. And the relationship, for example, China or France or Germany, all the education uh, uh, is uh, public. And government has a huge stay in uh, how this education, the funding, the type of scholarships, the type of curriculum, and I think that I would like to hear from all three of you, what is the, what do you see as the role of changing basic policy uh, uh, towards high school, uh, talking about China, the, the, we, we are talking about partners to society where the government has tremendous say as to the world uh, global citizenry. So as much as I appreciate you know, what we can do on the ground. Um, I would like to know how uh, you three think about uh, the relationship to government policies. How do you, can you influence that? Excellent point on government. Well, we take Steve. Careful on your head, Steve, though. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, do please introduce yourself also for those uh, who don't know. I'm Steve Waddell. Uh, I work uh, mainly with uh, global multi-stakeholder networks. So uh, I'm very sensitive to your position that there's fewer people, perhaps, uh, interested in this than uh, there may be. But I see uh, uh, people who are really uh, needing some uh, more aggressive work by education, uh, edu education institutions like universities in creating a global consciousness. Um, so these are all multi-stakeholder global networks. Uh, they're at the edge of our knowledge development, our capacity development. I'm very engaged in developing their capacity and knowledge in a variety of areas. It strikes me that universities are actually rather parochial. Um, they're very much uh, place-based. When they talk about doing something globally, it's like network, one, I work in a network world, but it's network 1.0, uh, really. Uh, it's like uh, us partnering with somebody else. I've I'm very interested in what Rob was talking about, about this larger network. Um, but it's, it's um, not very sophisticated in terms of thinking about how to create a network. There are tremendous barriers, obviously, uh, people experience in the way people get credentialed from university programs, etc. But I see a big need for uh, a much more um, global approach to creating education capacity development and knowledge building agendas uh, for people like I'm working with in these global networks. They need uh, a global approach to that. They need a network of education institutions that are going to be committed to the evolution of what they're working on, which is truly uh, global citizenship and taking action in the world for uh, the betterment of humanity. Uh, this includes Transparency International, the Forest Stewardship Council, the Global Reporting Initiative, the Global Compact, etc. Thank you. A bunch of interesting, provocative questions. Any of you, any of the questions? A couple of comments. Um, I thought it was interesting, and Kathy, is that um, you, you refer to government in the singular. Um, there is no single government, of course. Uh, there's so many different layers of government within the United States. Likewise, there's so many different universities that aren't part of any system either. Um, I mean, w w w w um, the three of us represent three private independent institutions um, that still are dependent on the government perhaps in, or, uh, in many respects. But the, it, I, I think it's a strength of the American system or the American non-system. Um, but at the same time, it does force the need for, for voluntary networks as opposed to um, formal ones or formal hierarchy. And I think when it comes to citizenship, I think our major responsibility as a participant in the society and a participant in government is through our, our alumni and ways in which we've educated them, um, as Fernando said, to, to be uh, predisposed towards activism um, as opposed to thinking narrowly and selfishly about themselves. So I think it's, it's difficult for any university in and of itself to navigate its, a, a, a strong relationship with government, but it's, it's very possible and it's very true, I think, that, that, we, that we do produce um, activists, if we do a good job, within our society. Um, and I'd like to end, quickly end with a question, because I, I, I think I, I, I don't really have an answer, but I, I'd like to ask Fernando, because I, mean, I, I was struck when he was speaking, um, you know, why is global education, which is so 
um, it seems so self-evident to us, such a threat to most of the United States. Can I also add for the others, and, and Jay, you can also come back, just building on Kathy's okay. question that as we look at the globe, there are places where the government may have a very different relationship. Yeah. And yeah. when you add the words, and, and you have to partner with, so part of that global conversation competency is to deal with the world with very different relationships to government and very different uh, notions of citizenship. Uh, and what that means. But but just wanted to throw that into the mix, Rob. Are you going to say something? No, no, no. I was just I was thinking. <laughs> it's always a good thing. So if I could uh, a good thing. quickly I, speak I to that, I, I don't think the challenges of global education in the United States at this time, at, at least in the places where I have done work, result from the fact that people find it threatening. But I think they result more from a kind of cultural mindset that we have come to develop over the last two decades that really holds very low expectations for our schools. I don't think that global ed is more of a threat than arts education is a threat or engineering education or civic education or history. Uh, but in many schools, we don't do any of, uh, of uh, we don't do much in that area because I think we, we have come to accept, we have become uh, very complacent with our education institutions. I think the, uh, we have to come to believe that there are only a few things our schools can do well. And I don't think this is true. I think that good education has always been about excellence and character. And I think it's only a recent creation in our kind of collective mind, this notion that you have to pick, that you either are going to teach math or develop character. I think that is a misconception. I think when you, when you do not explicitly develop character, then there is a character education that takes place by default. But I think it's better always to be deliberate about your education aims than to just let those sleep on the sides when you're not paying attention because you may then produce the kinds of leaders that get our economy in a mess in Wall Street who decide to take care of themselves as opposed to respond to those who place trust in them. Um, to the question of governments, of course I believe that governments are very important and I spend a good part of my time working with governments in this country at different levels and in other countries. But there are also limits to government. To speak about China, for example, a country where I have been uh, working extensively over the last uh, decade, uh, year. You look at who prepares leaders in education in China, and there are essentially four levels. You have the leaders prepared by the leading schools of education, Beijing Normal and Is China Normal. You have the leaders prepared by the rest of the colleges run by the Ministry of Education, the centers. You have the training that takes place by mm -hmm. districts, and you have the training that school principals themselves organize. And I would not assume, based on that experience, that the training that received the most support from the government is either the most innovative or the most effective. I think I've seen wonderful things organized by pr groups of principals themselves. I mean, it's the old Margaret Mead notion. There is nothing that a small group of committed people cannot achieve. I was recently in, in Beijing in the celebration of the 60th anniversary of the high school affiliated with Renmin University. And the woman who runs that school, one of the best schools in China, brought together leaders of what she considers the best uh, high schools in China and in the world. And on the topic of our conversation, how focused they all, well, they all were in developing global competency and how broad their conception of what a good education was. It was not at all about preparing the kids to take the university entrance exam. They were doing that too, but they were teaching so many other things. Um, so back to best practices, that's exactly what this woman did. She said, let me look at good things that are working. Let me convene exactly what you did and let's figure out a way out of this um, out of this mess in which many education systems find themselves, which is the mess of having achieved great success in including all kids and teaching them very little. So, Just uh, a quick comment on uh, Kathy's, uh, the, your question about government. Kathy, yeah, I teach um, modern Chinese literature and culture here at the university. But uh, some of the most powerful Citizenship education is experiential education. Students at all levels, whether elementary, high school, or c college age, uh, doing community work. And um, if organized and supported well, the educational results of that experience uh, are significant. One governmental policy option uh, is to require uh, since we'll, we'll make it a university example since that's our, uh, our topic. 
uh, is to have a national requirement that in order to get a, a, an undergraduate degree, you have to s complete a certain number of hours of community service. Uh, and Mexico, Colombia, Israel are among the a larger number of, <coughs> although a small number of countries that have such a requirement. They don't in and of themselves uh, accomplish a lot, but they do powerfully reinforce um, the kind of efforts that we're, that we're talking about. So I would answer your question to say, I, I would advocate that this country, that other countries can learn from the experience of those national um, graduation requirements, uh, which are indeed can be powerful levers for civic education. Rob, can I very briefly also ask you to, to push on Steve's question. W what are the lessons that in the Tilwar network, for example, you are learning about networks of universities? Universities are like, it's like herding cats. These are not institutions that are used to, you know, uh, talk to other institutions like them. They're, they're not only insular within, but insular I mean, I, without. I have two quick reactions, and I'd love to continue the conversation. Um, one is, uh, I think you're absolutely right that the technology, the so the hard and the soft technology of networks is just galloping. Uh, and that what I've described is a, a, a quite a rudimentary uh, I I example. Uh, and, and I think uh, Jay also met, I mean, I think the, it would be impossible in, uh, with this topic to spend too much time on technological change and opportunity. I mean, I think the examples that you mentioned are very significant, Jay. I think the other uh, reaction I had to uh, Steve's comment and question uh, is that we would do well to think about what is happening uh, with on our topic of global citizenship and the, the things that influence it that have nothing to do with the university. Um, uh, and that some of the most significant opportunities are ones that uh, our institutions have very little to do with, whether we're talking about the popular media or the greater ease of, of organizing an, an initiative that people who are unencumbered by you know, institutional constraints will, will have. And so I, my guess is that part of, what, part of our opportunity as university types is to connect with, learn from, those outside of university uh, efforts, including networks that just spring up and um, that are but that are having a, a very significant effect on our topic. But before I thank you all, and, and if I can ask for a one-line answer to to uh, to a very broad question and an unfair question, but since we are the center for the longer-range future, if you were looking into your crystal ball, let's say 30 years down the road. And if I were to ask you, do you see a world where global, the notion of global citizenship at that point would be more infused in society or less? And either way, what would you have seen the role of the university in having created that world, whatever that world might be? Unfair as it is, uh, well, a I'll, sentence I'll, or so. I'll give you an unfair answer then. <laughs> the answer is yes to both, in a sense. That, that I, no, I, I, I certainly believe that the way the world is moving culturally, economically, technologically, inevitably is going to uh, um, um, make our day-to-day -day lives much more global. At the same time, there is pushback. There is political, ideological pushback, um, patriotism, nationalism, parochialism, tribalism, et cetera, um, that, that, that always makes that difficult. And, and so as, as maybe, you know, if, 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 if I can certainly argue for historical inevitability, but I'm not sure that it's gonna be a smooth ride. Robin, you'd partly answered this already in your last last intervention, but where do you see and what do you see the role of the university being in that having? Uh, I think we will see emerging some new global universities and graduates of those universities. Uh, the examples that my colleagues have given, <coughs> I think those are the seeds of <coughs> what will sp grow new institutional forms and some of what today is just a, a an, a nascent joint degree program that crosses boundaries will morph into uh, higher ed consortia and institutions that are truly 
global in their location, in their curricula, oh. uh, and the graduates of those programs will be, um, be very interesting to see who they are and what they do. Last word. I, I, I don't see a world. I see a number of possible scenarios. In all of them, I think a very important issue is what are we going to do about violence, which I think is much closer than we think, uh, wherever we are. And I think it's a very important issue of our times. With regards to the university, uh, I believe we're in the middle of the reinvention of the university. I mean a serious reinvention, like the reinvention that took place in Berlin 250 years ago. We're too close to see it. The reinvention is not about the little changes that I do in my university or that happen places. The reinvention, I think, is taking place in the explosion of, of universities that is taking place uh, in countries like Brazil, in parts of the Middle East, in China. And with that explosion, I know there is great variation. Not all of those are going to survive. I don't know which are going to survive. But I believe that some of the forms that emerge are going to be much more relevant to the challenges of this century than the universities that we are in, that were a response, that have perfected a model that was relevant to the challenges of two and a half centuries ago. So um, I think we're going to see universities, some universities, that will be very attuned to the question of relevancy. And they're going to have to find ways to connect with societies and communities that we can only imagine. But I also th see a future where besides university, we're going to have a whole range of educational options that are going to be open, that will not be connected to universities. And some of them are beginning to see. For those of you who are curious and want to peek into that world, Google something called Khan Academy, yeah. K-H-A-N. Salman Khan. And Khan Academy is the result of what a fellow did in his home in yeah. Palo Alto out of a converted closet in his home where he has built the largest classroom in the world. Uh, I think we're going to see a proliferation of opportunities of that sort. And this is a particularly fascinating, this young Bangladeshi uh, guy, and the people behind him now are the founders of Google and Bill Gates. Bill Gates is Googling, is uh, Twittering about him. You know, I, I, so if you follow Bill Gates' Twitter, and I'm sure all of you do, uh, you will hear from Bill Gates about how great Sal Khan is. Uh, and even if you don't follow Bill Gates' Twitter, you should follow ours. Uh, because we will alert you to his. <laughs> and uh, on that very happy note, and thank you, I, I think those last question, even being unfair, I, I, we got a very thoughtful and, 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 and useful set of perspectives here. I really wanted to thank our three guests for a wonderful conversation, a conversation we all should continue in our own realms. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.